Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I also have a colleague's name on this um, presentation as well, Patrick Hogue, who I work with. This, this topic was also presented at um, the local Ann Arbor support group back in the spring. So for some of you that were there, this may be a repeat of information. Patrick and I um, met and, and put this together. I'm gonna give Patrick a lot of the kudos and I kind of um, added my two cents and changed things up a little bit for this presentation today. Um, as an occupational therapist, our goal with most patients is independence. Um, so making folks as, as independent as possible and caring for themselves. So along with that is also living independently, because most folks I work with, of course, that's a, that's a big motivator. I want to continue to stay in my home and be safe and live independently. Um, so I would have to say that's a goal with most all my patients when they come into the clinic um, we ask them all about their daily living skills and um, kind of develop goals based on um, what their wants and needs are. Aging in place is a term that's been used more recently um, that's been thrown around, some of you may have heard of. And along, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and give you a definition. So, the objectives today is going to be understanding um, what aging in place is and then also um, giving you, educating you a little bit about home modifications as well as assistive devices that can help a person continue to live independently um, and also uh, community resources. And all these three things kind of work together. Um, so you'll see as we talk about these different, um, these different things today, how they all kind of interface with each other. So what is aging in place? Um, a definition I've listed here is deciding to live in your current house for as long as possible despite physical changes associated with the aging or disease process. And the question becomes, how do I do this? So the two things um, that we're going to be talking about would be, or three things, are modifications. Um, how can I change my home to still, so I can still live there safely? Are there any assistive devices that might help me maintain my independence? And also, um, engagement in activities that can keep me healthy so I can continue to perform these tasks and activities. So what are home modifications? They're improvements and modifications, repairs to your home that can help you maintain your independence and prevent accidents. Um, the, how do I do this? I think the thing is just evaluating um, your home as it is now and asking yourself, do I feel safe here? Am I, am I able to accomplish my daily life activities? Um, just to give you an example, I had somebody in the clinic just a couple days ago, and he came in, and he already had some forethought. Um, it was a one visit, he came in, he said, he was currently living in his home, um, he uses a, um, a walker, and he has to access his downstairs, he has stairs, and he was, you know, his question was, what do I do? What, can, what kind of modifications can I make to my home now? I'm kind of safe now, but I'm looking at the future. I may, with the disease he, with the, um, disease he had, he felt there may be a time where I would, be, I would be in a wheelchair. So the question becomes, you know, should I stay here? Is it feasible that I can make modifications to my home? I feel like also this is a time where I could sell my home um, and so we talked about those things. What would it take to, to modify his existing home and what made the most sense? So I think that's, that's something people can start to look at um, to decide, is this where I want to be? You know, hence that aging in place. So the importance of home modifications, as we know, um, we talked about falls, and that, that's something that certainly, um, with Parkinson's disease, is a concern. Um, 
And so 38% of people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease fall each year, and falls are the leading cause of injury deaths in adults over 65. They're the most common cause of hospitalizations and 60% of falls occur in the home and mostly in the bathroom. Um, and it stands to reason, as we know, people getting in and out of tubs, um, showers, um, it's wet, the floor is wet, um, falls occur, getting on and off the toilet. So we'll be talking about modifications to that room for sure. There are fall prevention programs out there now. I know um, that sometimes I'll see patients, the physical therapist or myself, we will get referrals just for that. Um, and so we really discuss the same things I'm going to discuss today in regards to how to prevent those falls from occurring. So home modifications. Um, Here's a list of things I'm going to discuss. Um, ramps, lifts, doorway access, stair lifts. We're going to talk about home modifications in the bathroom, kitchen, good lighting is essential, and just organization of the home. So the first thing are um, ramps. Ramps. Certainly for somebody in a wheelchair, um, a ramp is pretty essential for getting, accessing a home. Um, for ramps have to be a minimum of about 10, 12 inches of run, and typically for every inch of rise, you need a foot of ramping. So for example, if you measured from the ground up to the porch to get into the home, and that was 15 inches, you would need a 15-foot ramp. Um, there, there's a minimum, you can also go to eight inches, but that would be recommended for somebody more in a power chair because of the steeper incline. It's a little more difficult um, for somebody in a manual chair to get up that ramp with that ratio. Um, there are specifications for ramp designs um, that have to meet ADA codes and um, there's permits from the city I believe that need to be pulled, but um, if you are gonna have somebody construct a ramp, um, there are guidelines for doing those um, appropriately. And then other things, I don't have a picture of lifts, but some of you have seen there are certainly lifts out there. If, for instance, I had a patient who didn't wanna take up, you know, ramps can be built in the front of a home, in the back of a home. Um, through a garage, I've seen a lot of ramps in garages because of the inclement weather, especially here in Michigan. Um, you know, being able to get up that ramp and keep it covered, it's a nice option, although people may not have the room in their garage. Um, I've, I have been to people's homes and they get lifts. So they're, they're lifts for wheelchairs where um, the gate opens and it lifts you right up to a platform and then you can access the home that way. Certainly more expensive, but um, those are available as well. There's also threshold ramps. Um, so we know um, that the thresholds can be really cause some falls and accidents for people going through doorways. So there, these ramps are commercially available. Um, they're great. Sometimes um, for, for this example right here, I recommended one for going out on a patio um, with a sliding door, the track. So these are available as well. So doorway access in a home. Um, I'm gonna talk about ideal, you know, ideal situations, but the ideal opening, especially with somebody in a chair again, um, would be 36 inches. Um, a good opening is 30, a minimum of uh, 32, a minimum of 30. Usually to get through the door, if somebody's trying to manipulate the chair, um, you have to have rooms for your arms. Um, those are kind of some standards we look at. And then also it's ideal, of course, if you're in a chair in a room, having a five foot turning radius so you can turn around in a room. Other um, possible door modifications, if people, um, you know, don't want to go through the expense 
of reframing a door. Offset hinges are an option, and they allow for two more inches of space, and those can be purchased at any hardware store, typically. Um, so that, that's a nice option. Can also remove door stops, which give another inch of, of um, clearance. Lever door handles make it easy for somebody um, going through a door, opening up a door, um, versus having to turn a knob. And here's some pictures. Stair lifts are another option for getting from um, floor to floor. Um, the, so you have to keep in, keep in mind that if you are using a stair lift, you know, the person needs to be able to transfer onto it safely. Um, but then also have some kind of, if you're using a mobility device, whether it's a walker or a wheelchair, that would have to be at the top of the stairs or the bottom of the stairs um, because that would be difficult for you to bring that with you. Um, there may be some people that carry a walker on that. Um, certainly a wheelchair would be quite difficult. Um, you'd also want to make sure um, the company came out and made sure you had a load-bearing wall and would give you some recommendations on um, what that lift would look like. So um, some of my patients that have got these really like them and they work well and it gets them from floor to floor. The bathroom I mentioned was, um, that's where the biggest occurrence of falls happen. Um, so that might be the very first thing I always address with my patients when they come to see me. We ask you know, questions about the bathroom. How are you getting on and off the toilet, in and out of the, you know, how are you showering? Do you have a walk-in shower, a shower with a lip, a shower-tub combo? Um, so we got to kind of get the layout of the bathroom, and then we proceed from there as far as problem solving um, and making recommendations. So these are a few things um, I have listed that we would look at. The seat, the, t the height of the toilet seat um, could be important. So we may, um, you know, now they're making higher toilet seats. I think the standard, used, there used to be about 15, 15 and a half inches. Now you can get a higher toilet at about 17. Um, there's raised toilet seats um, that can be attached to the toilet. Um, all different kinds of designs. Some have soft seats. They can go anywhere from two to f up to four or five inches. One of my patients recently said he found one at seven. Um, those are a little bit more difficult to find. They can come with railings, handrails. Um, sometimes people prefer not to have those, and they might have a grab bar mounted on the, on the wall. Accessible sinks are great for somebody in a chair. Um, because then you can get closer to the sink for grooming um, in the morning. Um, so those, those certainly are nice. Some of my patients don't have that luxury. They might sit sideways to the sink. Um, you know, certainly if you're ambulating and walking, that's, it's not as much of a concern. Um, so those are other things in, the, in an ideal situation. Um, as far as the bathroom, um, the getting in and out of the uh, shower. Um, certainly having a walk-in shower, that's the most accessible. You have nothing to, if somebody's walking, they don't have to step up and over a, a lip. Um, but if you have that lip there, you know, having a seat in the shower, um, it all depends, once again, on the person's mobility. I problem solve that with each individual. If they're ambulating, um, and they're walking right up and they have this two or three inch lip, you know, we'll talk about where the grab bars can be placed. Can they step up and over that lift safely to get onto that shower seat? Um, and then certainly in this picture, there's grab bars placed in, in, in many areas. If somebody doesn't have a walk-in shower um, and they only have the shower tub combo, and we assess that it's not safe for them to step over the edge of that bathtub, then we might recommend an, a transfer bench. Some of you probably maybe are using these or have seen them. So whether somebody's ambulating with a device or 
ambulating without a device or using a wheelchair, either way we get close to that extended seat. If they can stand um, or they're walking, they would just sit on the edge, lift the legs over and slide, slide into the tub. Um, if somebody was in a wheelchair, um, I might get the chair close enough. If there's room, that's the problem with these with bathrooms is having the space and room to make um, recommendations about the equipment. Um, but I might have somebody get their wheelchair close to that seat. We could use a sliding board um, and get them onto that seat as well. So once again, it's very individually based on a person's mobility. There's also um, transfer benches like that that actually have um, rails and the seat actually slides. If somebody's having difficulty with movement, um, and, there, and I had a patient recently I worked with um, with MS, not Parkinson's, but she didn't have room in her bathroom. So we found a seat like this that didn't have legs that came out over the edge of the tub, um, but it was on a track, the seat, and the, and the um, instead of those legs coming out, like little metal, they, these um, they kind of hinge to the side of the tub. Um, the one downside about this would be tucking in the shower curtain. So um, getting water on the floor, so you have to kind of like work with that shower curtain, get it around, but you're still, it's probably important to have a handheld shower nozzle so you can direct the spray and the water um, so you're not making puddles on the floor. But that's the one downside of the uh, tub transfer bench. Non-skid mats, if somebody is going to stand in a shower and bathe, um, certainly trying to prevent any type of fall, it's a consideration. Grab bars um, placed, um, they can be by the toilet, you know, they make them really fancy now and, um, you know, people ask me, oh, are the suction cup grab bars good? Um, I would never recommend them. I'm not going to rely on, on those sticking. Some people, some of my patients say they're phenomenal. You know, it really depends on how much weight somebody is bearing down on that grab bar, but certainly something that's secure in the wall is going to be, I would feel safer with than the suction cup. Um, so this is just an example of some pictures and placement. Um, the bars can be placed really based on somebody's height and where they want them. Um, certainly the advantage of going into someone's home to do the eval, I can actually uh, you know, see how somebody's transferring and getting in and we talk about placement. So on to the kitchen. Um, you know, once again, this isn't an area that everybody is going to do many modifications. It really depends on your engagement and meal prep activities and how involved somebody would wants to be um, in the kitchen. But certainly, the same thing stands here. If somebody was going to it was in a wheelchair and they wanted a height adjustable sink. Those certainly are out there. Um, and we had one in our kitchen that this one looks like it doesn't have the hydraulic on it, but we had one in our OT kitchen, and that's the downside if, if, the, high, if the electronics stop working. Um, but some of the patients just get a, like a standard um, height, um, sink placed, and um, they use it that way. So this is accessible. A wheelchair, looking at another accessible workspace in the kitchen. Uh, folks have tables right in their kitchen. That's certainly a place to, to work at. But um, sometimes folks, if they're, if they're doing some um, remodeling or they're looking at a home, um, this is always nice to have a workspace to sit at. I wouldn't call this a modification, I'd call this a, an assistive device because it's something that can just be purchased and used. But um, I, I make this recommendation for folks who are doing some meal prep in their kitchen and they're using a, a device to walk with or they're in a wheelchair again, you know, how are they transferring food from the microwave to the table or getting food out of the refrigerator to bring to prepare at a table or a work surface. So having a cart or a tray on wheels um, is always a nice option as well for transferring items. 
Um, some of my folks that are in wheelchairs, um, I recommend lap trays. Um, you can buy like portable lap trays that maybe hold things to carry from place to place. Lighting is also a consideration for safety. Um, maintaining good lighting in your home, using night lights in the bedroom and in the bathroom, especially if you're getting up at night and walking and someone may not have shoes on. There's a lot of you know, falls I think happen um, at night too when folks are trying to go to the bathroom. Um, so that's always a, a good consideration. Um, having light switches at entrance, you know, to, to, as you enter any room is really important, and by stairways as well. Types of lighting could be ambient overhead lighting, and then also task lighting if you're working um, at something close up. Another area to consider um, in your home is just organization, really looking at organizing areas, um, and I think having clutter-prone areas or reorganizing clutter-prone areas is important for safety as well, um, not only in cabinets and cupboards, but on floors and in areas. Um, I have gone and done home visits and have made recommendations. Even I've, I've seen, I've been in people's homes where um, there's really a fall risk depending on where things are placed in the home. Um, so that's certainly a consideration as well. Um, I think another thing, like here I'm mentioning, uh, store items that you use frequently, po like pots and pans, close to a work area. Because if you're reaching down or reaching up, that could, might, cause, um, that might uh, cause a person to fall. So really looking at your work areas and, make, and accommodating them to you for fall prevention. And also, um, and also for uh, conserving energy, um, a buzzword we use in OT a lot is work simplification and energy conservation. So you're simplifying the tasks um, by this way, um, being more successful in completion, um, especially if fatigue sets in. Um, and so you're simplifying the tasks and also um, uh, energy conservation, uh, conserving your energy so you can get more accomplished. So really, the more organized a home is and you're able to access things more easily, it makes that task uh, more efficient. So now I'm going to talk about assistive equipment for ADL stands for activities of daily living. Um, and these are things that we have in the clinic for folks to try. Um, most of, some of you may already use some of these devices. As an occupational therapist, once again, I'm going to always, I'm never going to try to push equipment on folks. I'm going to see if they can do tasks themselves because I feel it's so important to use our own muscles and our, um, to continue to maintain strength, you know, the coordination and use of um, your, you know, your, your muscles and everything to do these tasks. But if somebody can't do it and someone else is helping them, then by all means I'll, I'll say, hey, we have, we have an assistive device that might make you a little bit more independent um, in completing this task and you won't have to ask anybody for help. So um, I'll go through some of these. Um, so we talked about the um, raised toilet seats that adhere right onto the toilet, but there's also th um, commode chairs out there, and we call this a three-in-one commode because it could serve three purposes. Um, this is just a standard um, commode. They can come with all, a few more bells and whistles, cushioned, all of them adjust. Um, some have drop arms. If somebody's doing a sliding board transfer from a wheelchair onto a commode, um, but this is just a standard commode with the metal frame. Um, three in one meaning it can be used over the toilet if somebody doesn't want to put an extended or a, a, a raised toilet seat on the toilet. This frame would just sit right over the toilet. The bucket would come out, so it could be over the toilet. It could also be bedside at night um, with the bucket in for someone to use so they don't have to walk to the bathroom at night if that's a concern for safety. Um, and the third use could be as a tub 
is a, a shower seat, although um, probably not used as much that way. There's a lot of chairs that are fairly reasonably priced that folks use for their tubs. Adjustable beds and bed rails um, also can help folks with mobility in and out of bed. Um, you know, so you're getting a, a, a bed that adjusts and also different types of rails are commercially available. This is a very simple rail. Um, some are a little bit longer. They usually go at the head of the bed so the feet can swing out. Um, so those are certainly um, considerations for safety and mobility. Long-handled reachers can help um, folks with dressing, maybe getting objects off the floor, but there's also limitations to these. Um, you know, some have suction cups, some are, you know, they come in all, we try to carry, we try to have a few of them in our clinic so folks can try them before they purchase. Um, the limitation is it's limiting in how much you can pick up with this and how heavy it is for sure. Um, Long-handled sponges can help with bathing, um, reaching difficult areas, and by angled um, handles for these as well to reach the back. Um, and so that's, those are available for bathing. Sock aids, this can help somebody um, get socks on. So if somebody can't reach to get their socks on, then um, um, these sock aids are really useful and helpful for folks. Um, and they come in different designs and so on and so forth. Button aids are another, um, this is, not some once again, an aid that can help people as far as buttoning and unbuttoning um, shirts. Take, there's a little learning curve there, but they do work nicely once you get the hang of it. Um, as far as feeding, um, you know, with Parkinson's, um, we talked about tremors. So this is a device, um, maybe a company, Liftware. We have this in our clinic. Um, the jury's out on the use of it. I think it's, it's, once again, equipment is not for everybody and doesn't work for everybody. Um, I've seen this work nicely for some folks with Parkinson's um, and others not so much. They didn't feel it really helped. There's a motor inside of this device and it kind of modulates, it kind of adjusts itself to the, the tremor. And so um, that, that it comes with the, you can get a spoon, there's a spoon attachment and a fork attachment for this. It's very expensive though. I think it runs around $200. And um, what I might start by doing is just looking at with some of my Parkinson's patients, um, looking at just the setup, you know, where somebody's positioned at the table, um, sometimes uh, looking at just building up the, the fork handle. Um, you can buy utensils that are built up. You can buy utensils that are angled, and we have all those things in the clinic as well that I, that I look at with folks to make feeding um, easier. Um, knives, there's adaptive knives out there for cutting. This one is nice because um, pressure's put down into the, you know, as far as um, just using a steak knife. Um, th this, this knife is kind of one of the more popular ones that works quite nicely, and it's a rocker knife. And so um, putting kind of pressure down and, and rocking. Um, there's also loop handled knives that give a little bit more security. Um, and and those, those come in different um, size blades. Mobility and walker use is um, typically addressed by my our PT colleagues. And so looking at um, the the mobility devices would be something that they would address in finding um, the right fit for each person. Um, so those are some of the assistive devices, the more popular ones that we would um, talk about with folks. But once again, as I get to know somebody, um, there's certainly other devices out there, but those are things that we, that are the, that kind of come up in conversation mostly. As far as community resources, I'll talk a little bit about that next. Um, there's physical activity-based community resources, 
And there's a list of all these things. Um, I'm sure some of you in here have been involved in some of these activities, but these are kind of the popular activities that some of our Parkinson's population um, is partake, are partaking in. So um, I'm, you know, I'm the most familiar with the LSVT Big because we have a program at U of M um, that's been in existence, oh boy, maybe seven years. Um, our program, for some of you, really quickly, um, if you have, if you don't know a lot about um, Big and Loud. Um, we do the o OTs and PTs do the big portion, and our program is um, four days a week, four weeks. Um, the person comes in, and we do the exercises every time, both the OT and PT. And then, then if you're working with an OT two times a week, which it typically would be, then we address some of these other concerns and issues that may be problematic. Um, and PT does a lot with mobility, using big movements. The PT would use big mo movements with the mobi mobility um, concerns and issues, and OT would be using some of the big movements with the ADLs, the activities of daily living, like dressing, writing, um, getting keys out of pocket. So we incorporate the big movements into some of the daily life tasks and activities. Um, and then there's a list of Several, several other activities. Um, I'm in Ann Arbor, and I know we have a um, Ann Arbor support group, and um, some of these activities are offered around the Ann Arbor area, and, and I'm sure in some other communities as well. So here's a picture of somebody doing one of the step forward big exercises. Um, other resources are um, that I'm going to talk about are, um, you know, resources for some of the equipment. There, there's things called loan closets out there. And um, if you go to loancloset.org, you can, in search for your county, you can find out where some, um, some of these places are. And what's wonderful about that is they have free equipment. Uh, so you, you know, you loan out the equipment if you can keep it for as long as you'd like. And if it's in still great condition, you can return it for someone else. But um, these are available in, in many communities. There's also um, a site I, I found called um, Elder Locator. Um, I think I have it on the second page. I'll show you um, in a second. But these are different financial assistance resources, which is which is kind of nice here. So um, there's, you know, there's different resources for what you're looking at as far as um, giving some relief or help for modifications to the home. Um, it looks like as well, um, even like energy, like saving on energy bills. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And the, um, the resource I have is called Elder Care Locator. So if you go online and you look that up, um, you'll have access to maybe some of these other resources that could help. Because really with the home modification, some of you may be seeing that's all well and good, but some of those modifications I discussed earlier could be costly. Um, and so I think that's, it goes back to my initial point about you know, really reevaluating the home you're currently in and saying, is this a home that I can age in place in? Can I, can I continue to stay here and make the modifications I need that I might need in the future, you know? Or um, do I make a decision to go somewhere else that um, is gonna be more accessible and safe for me? So I think, um, you know, putting together a great team. I, I mean, what I just happened to, you know, I work with the interdisciplinary team. So these are areas we look at. Um, so when you look at a treatment team, um, you have your physician um, who's addressing all your medical concerns and, and, and medication and health concerns and, and all those things. And then you have the PT who might be looking at your mobility um, issues and concerns and addressing goals there. The occupational therapist, 
discussing with you um, regarding your independent living, and then a social worker who can address some of the resources that I just discussed and give you tips for um, resources um, in your area or community. So um, that's all I have um, in regards to modifications and assistive devices. Um, thanks for listening, and I certainly would take any questions right now. Thank you.